Welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Livable Communities webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Impact of the New MUTCD, uh, MUTCD on Pedestrians and Bicyclists. We are joined by Bruce Friedman and Scott Wainwright, who are on the MUTCD team at the Federal Highway Administration. My name is Jeremy Pinkham, and I am the Communication Coordinator for PBIC and the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, attendees, if you can hear me, click the hand in the box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to raise your hand so we can be sure our audience can hear us. Okay, lots of, lots of hands are going up, so that's a, that's a good sign. Uh, before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. Let's take a look at this slide that shows the webinar interface. As an attendee, you have a control box in the upper right corner of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking this arrow button. Uh, if for some reason your computer or web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and log back into the program. You'll be able to rejoin the session. If you experience audio difficulties during the webinar, please be sure you have selected which audio mode you are using and follow the instructions provided for that mode, and that's located in this control panel over on the right as well. Please note that attendees will not be able to uh, speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees on this call. So by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. Um, though you won't be able to speak, you will have the ability to ask questions by entering them in the question box um, down here on the right. Um, if you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it here. And I'll monitor these questions and respond to you if I'm able. Questions pertaining to the presentation itself may be asked at any time in the question box, but we will not um, get to them until the end of the program when we have built in about 40 minutes for a discussion period. Please feel free to ask those questions as we go along, and we'll get to them later. Uh, also, so that you are not alarmed when you exit the webinar, I want to let you know that a very brief survey will open up after you leave. We would very much appreciate your feedback on our performance. Um, and before we get started with today's program, I want to give everyone a little information about what this webinar is about. The goal of the Livable Communities webinar series is to better enable our audience to improve the quality of life in their communities by promoting safe walking and bicycling as a viable means of transportation and physical activity. The webinar series was developed by the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, which is the national clearinghouse of pedestrian and bicycle related safety information and resources. We offer information and technical assistance to diverse audiences about health and safety, engineering, advocacy, education, enforcement, access, and mobility as they relate to pedestrians and bicyclists. PBIC and today's webinar are both made possible with funding from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Highway Administration. And I also want to thank the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, that is uh, APBP, for co-sponsoring today's webinar. The next Livable Communities webinar will be held on Thursday, May 13th um, from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. The topic is the new program developed by PBIC called Walk Friendly Communities, and we will be presented by PBIC and PBIC's own Carl Sundstrom. The registration link can, be, can now be found at walkinginfo.org slash webinars. At this website, you will also be able to access archived recordings, transcripts, and additional resources from today's and past programs. And it'll take about a week to get today's webinar posted. Um, we'll also be um, posting today's uh, slideshow for everyone to download. Um, and I know I've been getting a lot of questions about that already. In addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and improving conditions for walking. These courses can be found at walkinginfo.org slash training. And now before I introduce our, our speakers, I want to take a quick poll from the audience. Um, let's see, here we go. And uh, please let us know how many participants are viewing the webinar at your site. And while you're completing the poll, I will introduce today's speakers. Um, first off is Bruce Friedman. He is a transportation specialist on the MUTCD team in the Office of Transportation Operations at the Federal Highway Administration in Washington, DC. The MUTCD team is responsible for the development and publication of the MUTCD. And Mr. Friedman's specific responsibilities include um, being the primary contact for parts eight and nine 
the traffic control for grade crossings and traffic control for bicycle facilities, respectively. He was a technical member of the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, devices for more than 25 years and served as the chair of the Signals Technical Committee and as the chair of the ITE delegation to the NCU TCD. In 2002, Mr. Friedman was selected as the Florida section of ITE's Transportation Engineer of the Year. And uh, uh, with him is Scott Wainwright. He is a highway engineer on the MUTCD team and was responsible for MUTCD's parts uh, four, traffic signals, and part three on markings. Uh, Mr. Wainwright served on the ITE Traffic Engineering Council Executive Board for four years and held elected offices at section, district, and international levels. He has been a member of, national, of the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices as well for 20 years and served as chair of, signal, of the Signals Technical Committee. Um, now we'll conclude our attendance poll. Um, close the poll. Most people have um, voted by now. And we'll take a quick look at the results. Um, Looks like uh, most of you are listening alone, but um, quite, a, quite a number of you are, um, have partners there. Hopefully you're all sharing some resources today and having a good discussion about this. Um, now I'm going to turn control of the screen over to our speakers for the feature presentation. And uh, I'd like to welcome and thank Bruce Friedman and Scott Wainwright for their presentation today. And just want to remind you all that we'll be taking uh, questions when they are through with their slides. So please take it from here. OK, we're going to get our slideshow up on the screen here. All right, well, thank you very much for attending today. And, and good afternoon to most of you. Good morning to those of you who are on the West Coast. It's great for us to have an opportunity to do an outreach here and explain some of the changes that have been made in the 2009 edition and uh, particularly, we're going to be paying attention to those changes that affect pedestrians and bicyclists. The new edition of the MUTCD contains a large number of changes from the 2003 edition, but there are a few overriding themes. But before I get into that, I'd like to give you a little bit of the history of the development of the 2009 manual. The Notice of Proposed Amendments that led to this manual was published in the Federal Register early 2008, and we had a seven-month comment period. During that comment period, we received almost 2,000 letters, and those letters had about 15,000 comments. We published the final rule on December 16, 2009, and at that same point, we put the MUTCD up on our website. And uh, that was the date of publishing. 30 days later, on January 15, 2010, was the effective date of the MUTCD. States do have up to two years, which would be January 15, 2012, to adopt the manual for their state, either adopting the national manual, adopting their own manual that's in substantial conformance, or adopting the national manual but with supplements uh, at the state level. So those. Some of those have, states have already adopted the manual. Some have not. But during the next two years, all, all 50 states plus uh, Puerto Rico and D.C. should have adopted it. As I said before, the 2009 manual, which replaces the 2003, has a few overriding themes. It includes new provisions that will promote uniformity particularly in some areas like toll facilities and managed lanes, these have not been covered in previous manuals, and there was a great need for uniformity in these areas as they're becoming more and more popular. It also includes new provisions that will be helpful to all types of road users, including pedestrians and bicyclists. Older drivers are also better accommodated in the 2009 edition with some new provisions being added that regard things like larger letter heights and brighter signs for the older road users. Successful innovative devices and applications, some of those that have been uh, under approved experiments over the past few years, such as, or even given interim approval for that matter, uh, such as AFADs, 
which are automated flagging assistance devices, flashing yellow arrows at signals, and pedestrian hybrid signals are also included in this edition. Now I want to get specifically, we're going to go part by part uh, about some of the changes that affect pedestrians and bicyclists. First, there's a new stop here for pedestrian sign that's been added. The yield here to pedestrian sign was in the 2003 edition. The stop here for pedestrians was added because some of the states have laws that require motorists to come to a complete stop rather than simply yield to pedestrians in a crosswalk. There's a new overhead pedestrian crossing sign in this edition that can be used to remind road users of laws regarding the right-of-way at unsignalized pedestrian crosswalks. This is similar to the one that's in the street, but this one would be mounted overhead over the approach to the crosswalk. In terms of the in-street pedestrian crossing signs, these were in the 2003 manual for use at unsignalized intersections. But the placement of in-street pedestrian crossing signs is restricted now to the roadway at the crosswalk location. That's really a clarification. That was the intent all along. It can be placed on the center line, on the lane line, or on a median island, but definitely restricted to the roadway. There's also a new option that allows the use of a fluorescent yellow-green background color for this sign, as well as for the overhead pedestrian crossing sign. There's also a new standard that's been added to require these signs, these in-street pedestrian crossing signs, that are not placed on physical islands to be designed such that they can bend over and then bounce back to their normal vertical position when they're struck by a vehicle. That would minimize the damage to the vehicle, but also injuries to pedestrians if the signs are struck by a passing vehicle. So if you put it on a raised island of some sort, it's not necessary, but if you put it within the pavement itself without a raised island, then it has to be the flexible support. The designs of many of the pedestrian push button signs have been revised to include a new symbol. It came from the Canadian MUTCD, but it's a standard symbol for push buttons in addition to the, to the words on the sign. And this will begin the symbolization of the push button message. One thing you need to keep in mind is that the finger needs to point in the direction of the crossing. So you can see the arrows on these signs at the bottom of the sign or in the middle of the sign is pointing in the same direction as the finger pushing the button is pointing. Also, to reflect changes that have been made in Part 4, pedestrian push button signs that don't clearly indicate which crosswalk signal is being actuated by each pedestrian detector They've either been deleted from the manual or they've been redesigned so that they do identify a specific crosswalk. <clears throat> There's also a couple of new special purpose pedestrian signs, such as the two that are shown on this slide. The one on the left is for use with the in-roadway warning lights. The one on the right is for use where push buttons given a push buttons where you have an extended uh, button push would call for additional features to be initiated during the next cycle, perhaps uh, extra crossing time. The R1015 sign, the one that's crossed out on this slide, uh, has been changed to be a more symbolic sign to make the sign more conspicuous to road users. This was a design that's been successfully tested and used by New York City. The use of fluorescent yellow-green for a background color has been changed from an option to a requirement for school and school bus warning signs. So if it's a school sign now, it has to be fluorescent yellow-green, cannot still be yellow. The option to use a fluorescent yellow-green background for warning signs associated with pedestrians and bicyclists and playgrounds is retained. So you can still use yellow or fluorescent yellow-green for the pedestrian, bike, and playground signs, but not for school. That has to be fluorescent yellow-green. The fluorescent yellow-green provides enhanced conspicuity, particularly during dawn and twilight hours. And in the intervening years since this color was first introduced in the late 90s, most highway agencies have already adopted policies to use this color at school, for school signs. 
And many have also decided to use it for warnings associated with pedestrians and bicycles. The intent is that this change will provide more uniformity and consistency in school warning signing. There's also a new sign and a supplemental plaque that's been added to provide warning of a shared use path that's used by both bicyclists and pedestrians. Without this new sign, as noted in the photo on the right, you can see that you have to use two signs, both a pedestrian crossing sign and a bicycle crossing sign. With more and more shared use paths used by both modes, uh, this new combined design will allow a single sign to be used. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Scott Wainwright to talk about parts three and four. Good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Uh, continuing on talking about pavement markings. Uh, the issue of raised pavement markers on the right-hand edge lines. Uh, in the past uh, editions of the manual, there has been a blanket statement that uh, raised pavement markers should not be used on right-hand edge lines. And the concern has been uh, about the impact on bicyclists because uh, bikes that run over these can sometimes be thrown out of control. But uh, the other side of the story is there are some situations where bicyclists either don't use the facility, are not allowed to use the facility, or are extremely uh, rare and on the other hand, uh, there can be a very significant safety benefit to motorists from using these. So basically, the, the guidance against the use of RPMs on right-hand edge line has been softened for some conditions. And as you can see on the screen here, it, it talks about engineering judgment being applied to evaluate the benefits of the enhanced delineation versus possible impacts to bicycles. And the other issue is that the RPMs have to be spaced close enough together so that they wouldn't be misinterpreted as a, a broken line, in other words, a lane line on a wet night. The uh, placement, the decision of installing crosswalks at uncontrolled locations, mid-block or uh, such as shown in, in this photo here on the slides, uh, Charlie Zagier at University of North Carolina did uh, produce a study uh, a few years ago for FHWA that identified the conditions where uh, putting in a crosswalk alone without other substantial measures uh, is, is not advisable. Uh, and basically that, the recommendations from that study are now in the MUTCD as guidance that uh, if there are four or more travel lanes and the speed limit is over 40 miles per hour uh, and the ADT is over 12,000 with no island or 15,000 if there is a, a median island, then basically you shouldn't be putting in new marked crosswalks unless there's other measures that are taken to reduce the speed, shorten the crossing distance, enhance driver awareness and so forth. Uh, Again, safety, the safety study by uh, UNC was quite clear on this. And this is being applied, the way it's written in the manual now is to apply to new marked crosswalks. In other words, this, this criteria should be used in decisions that are being made from now on of whether to put in a crosswalk. Uh, as we all know, there are many existing marked crosswalks out there under these conditions don't have other substantial measures with them. Uh, it's obviously good advice to try to, at some point, go back and reevaluate all of those existing locations. Uh, but the words that are in the MUTCD as of now do not require that yet. Uh, there is a whole new chapter that's been added to Part 3 dealing with pavement markings at roundabouts. And of course, this affects pedestrians and bicyclists because of the, uh, the operation of a roundabout. Uh, the text and the figures all address uh, the locations of the crosswalks uh, adjacent to the roundabout, uh, what to do with bike lanes uh, approaching a roundabout. Uh, so a lot of new guidance, uh, standards guidance and options concerning pavement markings at roundabouts. Colored pavements uh, is a kind of a continuing issue, has been for some time. 
Uh, there's a lot of interest in using colored pavements for various things. Uh, and particularly at crosswalks, there has been an issue of uh, it's really started out with the idea of brick crosswalks. A number of communities uh, for some time now have been uh, installing brick crosswalks really as part of their streetscaping projects for aesthetic enhancements. It's really not intended to try to communicate a message to pedestrians or to drivers. It's, it's predominantly for aesthetics. Uh, and under those situations, as long as you've got the white lines that actually establish the crosswalk, uh, there's no issue with putting uh, bricks uh, or other types of colors or patterns within the crosswalk, as long as it doesn't uh, compromise the conspicuity or the contrast of those white crosswalk lines, and as long as the color is not a traffic control color. Now, uh, there are some applications that we've seen, uh, such as in the photo at the bottom left with the red X's through it, where uh, various materials that are retroreflective have been placed within the crosswalk lines. And various colors, such as in this photo, uh, a fluorescent yellow-green retroreflective material is part of that crosswalk. Uh, it's in the MUTCD now. It, we, we issued an interpretation on it some time back, but now it's officially in the MUTCD that if it's retroreflective, uh, it's obviously trying to communicate a message to the driver or the pedestrian. So it's a traffic control device. And if it's a traffic control device, it has to comply with the normal color code uh, and other, you know, other provisions that apply to markings. And fluorescent yellow-green is not an approved color for crosswalks. White is the only approved color for crosswalks. So hopefully that will clear up any confusion on that. Now we'll move on into traffic signals. And there are a lot of things uh, pertaining to pedestrians uh, that have been changed in part four regarding signals. First of all, the warrant, uh, warrant number four, pedestrian volume warrant, has been changed. Uh, basically, it's now a graphical approach uh, where the major street volume and the pedestrian crossing volume uh, for a given hours uh, are plotted on a, on a graph such as this, very similar to the vehicular volume warrants. And the bottom line is that uh, it's generally easier to uh, meet the pedestrian uh, crossing warrant now in the MUTCD. Not in all cases, but just as a general statement, it's slightly easier uh, to meet this warrant. There's also a provision about uh, signals that are installed based on warrant 4 or warrant 5. In other words, based on the pedestrian volume or the school crossing volume, not the vehicular volume uh, of a side street. A lot of uh, situations involve a pedestrian crossing that is adjacent to uh, an intersection like this shown on the photo, where the, it's a very minor side street. The side street has a stop sign. It's, it's, the, it's the volume of pedestrians crossing that creates the need for the signal. Uh, in the past, there has been uh, occasions where jurisdictions have installed what's called a, ha a half signal, such as shown in this photo, where the signals are installed to control only the major street and not the minor street. The stop sign remains for the minor street. And this has caused a lot of operational issues, a lot of concerns about compromising the meaning of the green light itself. And basically, uh, the text of the manual now uh, encapsulates what FHWA's policy has been since, uh, since the 1990s uh, that basically discourages the use of this kind of an operation, a half signal. It basically says if you're putting in a signal based on either of these two warrants, you really need to put up signal faces and control the side street approaches as well. There's a new uh, device uh, called the pedestrian hybrid beacon. Uh, which many people have referred to in the past as a hawk signal. 
Uh, it was pioneered in Tucson, Arizona, the, where uh, several dozen of them ha have been installed over the last couple of decades. And basically, studies have found it to be uh, a very effective device. There have been concerns about calling it a traffic signal, a hawk signal, uh, as I say, was the previous name. Because in many states, there are state laws that say that if a signal is dark, um, it appears as if it's not operating. And that the state law says under those conditions, drivers have to treat it as a four-way stop. Well, in this case, the signal, the, the device is, in fact, dark in between activations. As you can see at the, t the left there, the item number one, dark until activated. And there's no intention that drivers should treat this as a four-way stop during those conditions. So uh, it was decided to call this device officially a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Uh, basically, it does share some characteristics of both a signal and a beacon because it, it has a, a flashing operation as a part of it. But by calling it a beacon, we're hoping that it doesn't uh, uh, create conflicts with some state laws. This is a new provision. Uh, it's, it's always been good engineering practice, but now it's in the MUTCD uh, as a requirement. And that is that if the timing of the pedestrian signals is only giving pedestrians enough time to cross to the median and basically requiring them to cross in two separate stages, two separate cycles, uh, then basically it's now required that pedestrian signals, push buttons if it's an actuated phase, and signs are required in the median. Uh, it's basically not appropriate to strand a pedestrian in the median and hope that they figure out uh, what to do. In the proposal that we had put out in 2008 for the text of the next manual, we had proposed changing the meaning of the flashing orange hand um, when it's accompanied by a countdown. The issue is obviously that, uh, in a sense, we're sending mixed messages here. The meaning, the, uh, the, the previous meaning of the flashing orange hand is that if you're if you if you're still on the curb and haven't started crossing yet, uh, you're not supposed to start cross crossing. But if you have started, you're out in the crosswalk. Uh, the flashing orange hand means that you can continue crossing and finish. Uh, the countdown is really providing more information than has ever been provided before. And obviously, we know that pedestrian signals are timed based on a certain walking speed uh, that many people can walk faster than. And uh, we know that where countdowns are installed, a lot of people do leave the curb after the flashing orange hand comes on. And they are able to finish their crossing safely and well before the conflicting traffic uh, starts moving. So we had proposed to change the meaning to basically legalize that. Um, based on the comments we received, our decision was to not adopt that change. Uh, there are concerns, and very valid concerns, about having two separate meanings for the flashing orange hand, depending on whether a countdown is present or not, and concerns about the ability to educate particularly young school children uh, when we have two separate meanings like that. So at some point in the future, this issue may be resolved. Uh, we're hoping that research will be done uh, to look at the possibility, actually, of eliminating the flashing orange hand altogether uh, and just using a countdown as the only uh, message um, of, of a clearance time, basically. But again, that requires research, and we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, this provision uh, has been added to the manual. Again, this is really kind of common sense, but uh, believe it or not, uh, some of you on the line for this webinar may have seen this yourself. There, there unfortunately are some locations where the jurisdiction has uh, uh, put in uh, walk signals for crossing a channelized right turn movement like shown on this slide. and for whatever reason, uh, are showing a walk indication to have people cross that right turn slot 
uh, during times when traffic making a right turn uh, is not receiving a red signal. Uh, it's, it's definitely a conflict. So anyway, now there's language, specific language in the MUTCD to, uh, to require that either a steady red or a flashing red has to be displayed to any conflicting vehicular movement uh, under this kind of a situation. We talked about walking speed of pedestrians. Um, you're probably aware of some of the studies that have been done uh, that have found that the four feet per second, which has been in the past the recommended uh, walking speed for calculating pedestrian clearance time, doesn't uh, provide for uh, a large enough percentage of the walking population. Um, so the new manual does, in fact, re reduce the assumed walking speed for the pedestrian clearance time down to 3.5 feet per second. There are some exceptions, as you can see on the screen. And there's also what we call a cross-check uh, that applies, basically comes into play when you've got some very long pedestrian uh, crosswalk uh, lengths up in the range of 100 feet or so. This cross-check of uh, checking it for a 3 feet per second uh, speed from the top of the ramp or the, the uh, push button to the far side can sometimes result in you needing to add a, a few seconds of walk time. And uh, there's a new figure uh, in the manual, figure 4E2, which kind of clarifies and hopefully makes it easier to understand the relationship between the pedestrian intervals and the vehicular intervals. This is a fairly complex and complicated issue uh, that a number of people have had difficulty understanding. And there have been some changes uh, in the actual words of the manual, uh, adding this phrase about buffer interval, uh, making sure that the, the countdown and the end of the flashing don't walk occur at least three seconds before uh, the conflicting traffic gets a green. That's new stuff. It's all pointed out uh, in the text and in the, the figure for E2. So take a look at that when you get a chance. Um, and uh, one thing I did want to mention uh, about this exception, uh, it there is an exception that allows the use of a four feet per second walking speed to calculate that pedestrian clearance time. If you have an extended button press or some other means to allow the, the slower pedestrians to request additional crossing time. And I just wanted to point out that this is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about having to pay to insert coins to receive your extra crossing time. It's really just a matter of an extended button press, as in that sign that uh, Bruce had displayed earlier. The leading pedestrian interval is now in the MUTCD. Again, this has been a rather uh, common practice that really wasn't in conflict with the MUTCD in the past. But now there's words in there that uh, specifically allow it and describe how to do it. The countdowns are now required for all pedestrian signals where the pedestrian change interval is more than seven seconds. You can use the countdowns even if the pedestrian change interval is seven seconds or less. So basically, many cities are installing the countdowns for all of their pedestrian signals. We know that. Uh, but there are some jurisdictions that are concerned that for particularly short crosswalks across narrow streets that it might be unnecessary to have a countdown for those conditions. So that's what this provision uh, says that if it's less than seven seconds, uh, there's no need for a countdown. And uh, there is no specific compliance date for retrofitting all the existing pedestrian signals that don't currently have countdowns. That can uh, be done when the ped heads reach the end of their service life and are replaced. But in reality, m many if not most jurisdictions are proceeding uh, you know, straight ahead, basically, with, uh, with putting in countdowns almost everywhere because they are so popular and they do have a good safety benefit. Pedestrian push button locations. Uh, the, the photo in this slide shows a, an example that's unfortunately all too common 
of very poor, inappropriate pedestrian push button location. Out of, out of the way, not close to the crosswalk, people in wheelchairs uh, and blind people uh, would have extreme difficulty in getting to this push button. So the new manual does basically provide more specific guidance on the location of pedestrian push buttons, and tightens it up considerably, and pretty much follows the guidance that had been in the MUTCD earlier uh, concerning APS, uh, accessible pedestrian signal push buttons, very similar to that. And uh, as Bruce had mentioned, uh, the signs that are used with the push buttons are now required to clearly indicate which crosswalk is activated by which push button. And uh, I just found this interesting on a, a trip I went to a number of years ago to Prague, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic. Uh, found this really interesting application of a pedestrian signal. This happens to be a, a one-person wide alley leading to a restaurant. Uh, so they put up pedestrian signals push with push buttons uh, at either end of the little alley so that you can call your walk signal to get your alternating one-way pedestrian flow through the alley. Now APS, uh, talked about that a little bit. Uh, the provisions concerning APS have not changed a lot since the 2003 manual. There have been some changes, but one of the main things we did is we combined and reorganized the information on APS into these five new sections and basically makes the material a lot easier to access and uh, follow when you're trying to find provisions concerning APS. The push button locations, um, again, similar to what was in the two th 2003 manual, basically they're, they're supposed to be as close as possible to the crosswalk line that's furthest from the center of the intersection. That's shown with the red arrows here. And if there are two buttons on the same corner, they have to be separated by at least 10 feet, unless the physical constraints make it impractical. APS walk indications, when the walk signal is on. The, the accessible walk, inter, walk signal has to be both audible and vibrotactile, and obviously the same length, the same duration as the walk interval. If an, the audible type walk uh, signal is, a, is now to be a percussive tone, the ticking sound. Uh, now, the exception to that is if there are two buttons on the same corner that can't be located 10 feet apart or more, or if it's on the same pole, then speech walk, walk message needs to be used rather than audible. And the speech walk message goes street name. Walk sign is on to cross street name with the street name, of course, being the name of the street, like Broadway or whatever. Uh, the reason is that uh, blind pedestrians, when, when the, when the uh, buttons are closer than 10 feet apart, blind pedestrians have a very difficult time discerning where the ticking sound is coming from. And of course, the vibrotactile walk indication is the, the vibrating tactile arrow. The tactile arrows have to be located on each push button. They have to be aligned parallel to the direction of travel on the crosswalk that it's associated with. The locator tone has to be incorporated into each push button and obviously operates during the intervals other than the walk interval. The extended push button press is uh, a new way that's in the MUTCD now to call special APS features. Uh, you can use it to call for a longer crossing time. You can use it to call for a speech information message. Now that's different from a speech walk message. The speech information message can give information, for example, about the geometry of the intersection, uh, things like that. Uh, and you can also use the extended push button press uh, to call in audible beaconing. The information message, as I mentioned, uh, only used during intervals other than the walk. Um, the, the message format is uh, wait, wait to cross Broadway at Howard. Uh, and things like unusual geometry and phasing can also be talked about. So that finishes the uh, 
markings and signals part, and I will turn it back now to Bruce to go on with the other parts of the MUTCD. Okay, you'll notice that we seem to have skipped from four to seven, leaving two other numbers uh, uh, out of it. Part five, there really weren't a lot of changes overall, um, basically just keeping it up with the other parts because it overlaps so much for low volume roads. Part six had some changes, not all that many, but none of them were particularly uh, about pedestrians and bicyclists. So we'll leave those out of this presentation as well and move on to part seven, which is school area traffic control devices. The school children symbol can be used instead of the pedestrian symbol on the end street signs at school crossings. This actually reflects an official interpretation that was issued a number of years ago in response to a question about the signs in the 2003 manual that we did say that um, school children, if it's for a particular um, school crosswalk, uh, could be used on the sign. Similarly, the overhead uh, pedestrian crossing signs that have been placed for the first time in this manual um, can also be uh, used with the school children symbol if it's a school crossing that's unsignalized. In section 7D.05, which is operating procedures for adult crossing guards, the guidance statement is changed to a standard which makes all of the paragraph requirements, uh, makes all of the paragraphs requirements not recommendations anymore. So you can see all of the things that the adult crossing guard shall do now rather than should do as we said in the past. And because of the safety of school children being so paramount, it's important that the adult crossing guards follow these specific requirements when they control traffic in the assisting school children across the road. There's also a new requirement added to part seven that adult school crossing guards and law enforcement officers, when they're performing school crossing supervision, that they shall wear high visibility safety apparel, even on non-federal aid highways. There is a compliance date of December 31, 2011, which is approximately two years from the effective date of the 2009 manual. We did uh, do some rulemaking. Uh, on federal aid highways a couple of years ago, but this extends now in the, in the manual, extends it to all highways and streets, not just those that are federal aid. Also, the provisions that used to be in Chapter 7E regarding student safety patrols, those have been deleted because we feel it's not appropriate for students to control traffic. In Part 8, grade crossings, uh, the main change in Part 8 is that Parts 8 and 10 were combined, and light rail transit and rail grade crossings are now covered in the same part to eliminate a lot of overlap. There were a couple of items that affect pedestrians or bicyclists directly. One of those has to do with LRT grade crossings. Because LRT vehicles are almost always nearly silent, and blind pedestrians can't see flashing lights. An existing option that was in the 2003 manual is now changed to a requirement that audible devices be provided and operated in conjunction with flashing light signals or traffic control signals if those are being used to, to control a light rail transit grade crossing. So pedestrians are using the crossing and uh, it has flashing lights or traffic control signals, then it also must have an audible device that could be a bell, it could be uh, an accessible pedestrian signal, those sorts of things, but something that the blind pedestrian can use to know when to cross the track. This requirement to use an audible warning device assures that information about the approach of an LRT vehicle is available to blind pedestrians. There's also a new chapter, 8D providing information regarding traffic control devices that are used at pathway grade crossings. Because shared use paths and other similar facilities often cross either railroad or light rail transit tracks, it's important that suitable devices be used to provide for the safe and effective operation at such crossings. And now finally, the last part to talk about, part nine, and I'm sure that the, the bicycling community that's been 
patient all this time with the uh, pedestrian uh, changes will, will now perk up a little bit, and we're going to talk for the rest of the presentation part of the webinar about bicycles. And I guess this isn't the greatest slide to start with when I'm talking to the bicycling community, but uh, it is an interesting sign apparently out there somewhere, but uh, definitely not included in this edition of the manual. As far as the changes in Part 9 are concerned, the minimum lateral offset requirement for traffic control devices on shared use paths has been changed from 3 feet to 2 feet. It's been reduced. And it now indicates that no portion of a traffic control device or its support shall be placed less than 2 feet laterally from the edge of the path. The maximum lateral offset of 6 feet and the maximum mounting height of 5 feet are, have been deleted. The use of bicycle lane regulatory signs and plaques is no longer required where marked bike lanes are present. It is now okay to use pavement markings alone to designate a bike lane. There are recommendations that have been added regarding the placement of bicycle lane signs and plaques if an agency does decide to use them. These changes provide flexibility for agencies that don't desire to use the bicycle lane signs but they don't restrict the ability of jurisdictions that prefer to use the signs to continue to do so. And as a result of this change in Part 9, we also had to go back to Part 1, where all definitions are, by the way, at this point, uh, there are no more definitions within the individual parts. But back in Section 1A13, the definition of a bicycle lane was changed to indicate that it could be designated by pavement markings alone and that signs may be used to supplement those markings but are not required. There's a new bicycles may use full lane sign that's been added for use in locations where it's important to inform road users that the travel lanes are too narrow for bicyclists and motorists to operate side by side. This is a sign that can be used in conjunction with the new shared lane markings that I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes but it does, they aren't required to be used together. One or the other can be used alone, or both can be used in combination. There's some new no skaters and no equestrian symbol signs that have been added. These complement the existing no pedestrians and no bicycle symbol signs that have been in the manual. Two new bicycle push button signs that include a bicycle symbol are added to inform bicyclists that they need to press a push button to receive a green indication. This is consistent, as you, as you can see from the slides I showed earlier, with the similar new signs for pedestrians in Chapter 2B. Also, the push button to turn on warning light sign has been added to Part 9 for optional use, where bicyclists are crossing a roadway where in-roadway warning lights or other types of warning lights or beacons have been provided. The legend on the W5-4A sign has been changed, as you can see, from bikeway narrows to path narrows because shared use paths are the only bikeway type on which this sign is used. And the use of this sign on other types of bikeways would be inappropriate or confusing and should not be encouraged. It also presents a, a smaller word message. Consistent with the proposed changes in Chapter 2C that I talked about uh, earlier in the presentation, the new combined bicycle-pedestrian sign and the new trail crossing plaque are also added in Part 9 to provide warning of shared-use path crossing that's used by both pedestrians and bicyclists. There's a new section about object markers for use on shared-use paths, and basically uh, what this does is creates a smaller size proportionally reduced so that uh, the lower operating speeds at shared use paths uh, would be more appropriate for those speeds. In fact, the signs are 6 inch wide and 18 inches tall rather than the larger signs that are used for roadways. Several new bicycle destination guide signs along with information about their use were added to provide flexibility and potentially reduce the cost of signing bicycle routes particularly in urban areas where multiple routes might intersect or overlap each other. Among these signs are new alternative guide signs for bike routes and new bicycle destination and distance signs. 
Similar to the object markers, there's a new section regarding reference location signs for use on shared use paths. Because some of the, the paths are long enough to, and are linear enough that they lend themselves to the application of these reference location signs. The signs, again, are proportionally lower in size based on lower operating speeds. And they use a 6-inch wide panel with 4.5-inch tall numerals. There's a new section that's been added regarding four new mode-specific guide signs for use on shared use paths. This section contains information regarding the use of signs that guide different types of users to separate pathways where they're available. Currently, the manual provides only signs that prohibit user types, not signs that show which types are permitted. As a result, jurisdictions have commonly installed a variety of non-standard mode guide signs. We also added a figure to the manual that shows how these new standard signs might be used. There's a new bicycle route, which is M1-8A, sign that's been added. It retains the clear, simple, uniform design of the M1-8, but it provides a space near the top of the sign that, where you can put a pictograph or words that are associated with the route or with the agency that has jurisdiction over the route. There's been a significant amount of interest in allowing agencies to develop unique or distinctive route number signs for bicycle routes much in the same way that states can design their own route number signs. The M18 sign is retained in the manual, though for, there are some agencies that don't want to put the distinctive pictograph similar wording. The design of the U.S. bicycle route sign has been revised. Basically what's happened here is that the larger bicycle symbol is now being used on the top part of the sign and the, what used to be the large route number is now a, small, a smaller route number at the bottom of the sign. The reason for this change is, is to give the motorist an immediate impression of a bicycle numbered route rather than a highway numbered route that can also be used by bicyclists. And it also provides consistency with AASHTO's recommended design for the sign. So the bicyclist will still clearly be able to see, and in fact even more can tell that this sign is intended for their use and their routing. And uh, it'll go, uh, it'll, it'll be a lot easier for motorists to see that this isn't a Route 95 for motorists to follow that bicycles can also use. So we think this design is going to be superior to what had been used in the past. We've also made significant changes to the designs and the sizes of the bicycle route auxiliary signs to improve the consistency between parts 2 and 9. Basically, these are now the, the same proportional type signs, same layout as the uh, route marker signs that you would find back in Chapter 2D, rather than, uh, as you see in the past with the red X, where we had thinner uh, type sign arrangements. And finally, there's a new shared lane pavement marking that's been added to the manual. I know this has been long awaited. Uh, we had about 15 or 20 agencies officially experimenting with this device. And uh, it seems like a lot of cities have been wanting to use it. And it's now placed in the manual. Basically, this marking assists bicyclists in determining where their appropriate line of travel would be. And it cues motorists to pass with sufficient clearance and also gives them an idea that this is a roadway that may be used by bicyclists. Um, not that roadways that don't have this symbol can't be, but it, it alerts them to the possible presence of bicyclists more than not having the symbol would. The purpose of the new marking is to, is to reduce the number and severity of bicycle vehicle crashes. And one crash type that we're really hoping this cuts back on are the crashes that involve bicyclists colliding with suddenly open doors of parallel parked vehicles, also known as dooring. But uh, you can see in the photo on the left that the Chevron is placed far enough away from the edge of the pavement and the edge of the parking area that uh, drivers who open their door would, would not be in danger of, of being struck by bicyclists. So with that, we'll end the formal part of the presentation. And we'll open it up for the Q&A session. So we'll put a, ourselves on speakerphone. And Jeremy, if you want to uh, give us some idea of what the questions are. OK, great. Um, 
Thanks, Bruce and Scott, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have, um, looks like, about 35, 40 minutes for questions. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, please enter your questions into the box on your screen. I'm already getting quite a few. Um, I'm going to read these questions out to our experts here um, for them to answer. And I want to apologize in advance for the constrained format of the Q&A, but with over 500 people listening in today, this approach seems to make the most sense. Um, Jeremy? Yes. Jeremy, this is Scott. If you don't mind me interjecting one statement before you get sure. into the questions, because I have a feeling you, some of your questions may be asking this, and that has to do with the FHWA's MUTCD website. Uh, the website, as well as a lot of FHWA websites, have been totally down since last Friday. And we've just been bombarded with <laughs> questions from people about, what's going on? I can't access the MUTCD. When's it going to come back? And uh, the answer is, about two hours ago, it was finally put back online. So uh, if you've been trying to get to the MUTCD online, you now can do it. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay, that's great. I, uh, I had that question for you guys earlier today, too, and I checked it out. Um, and uh, on this slide here, I've posted that, that link to, to the website as well. So, um, okay, now we'll go into the, the questions. Um, the first one um, is uh, from Paul. He asks, what is in the works for delineating and marking bike boxes um, or any policy direction on the use of bike boxes? Okay, I'll take that one. Um, we do have a number of experiments going on right now with bike boxes. Portland, Oregon having been the first one to um, ask to experiment and get approval to experiment. But there are a number of other cities around the country that are also experimenting with bike boxes. And I even have a couple of new requests that have come in that um, haven't been responded to yet. But they seem to be coming to be becoming fairly popular. Um, for, for those of you on the call that may not know what bike boxes are, it's basically an area in front of the stop line, closer to the intersection from the motor vehicle stop line, at locations where there's a through and right combination lane, and the bicyclist doesn't have any way of knowing whether the motorist is going to go straight or right. It's a way for the bicyclist to come up to the right of that first vehicle in the bike lane and then move over to be in front of the motorist as the light turns green. Uh, bike boxes aren't particularly helpful when both the motorist and the bicyclist are coming up on a light that's already green, but in most cases the motor vehicle is traveling faster than the bicyclist, so they have had the ability to notice the bicyclist. The reason that, that this device is being experimented with, the problem it's trying to solve is the first vehicle at the stop line when the light's red, if a bicyclist pulls up to the right and waits at the red light along with that motor vehicle, particularly if that vehicle is a truck or some type of, of uh, SUV, that sort of thing, where they can't see very well to their right, both start up on the green, and then if the driver of the motor vehicle turns right, uh, they frequently uh, have a chance to collide with the bicyclist. Portland had a couple of fatalities of this regard and wanted to try the bike box out. But to get to the bottom line of the question, what is its status? Uh, it did not make the uh, 2009 edition, so it's still experimental. And there, does, there is some data being collected. It's inconclusive right now, but there's certainly, I'm finding people on both sides of the issue. There are some who think this is great. And there are, are many people around the country who don't particularly like the bike box. They don't think it's a good treatment. So the jury is out on it. Um, we'll have to wait and see when we develop the next notice proposed amendments, probably in 2012 or so, uh, whether this is something that we want to include as a proposed new device. OK, thank you. Um, now I have a question um, regarding um, the crosswalk installation guidelines. And um, this, uh, Michael would like to know whether or not the, um, the speed, um, when you're talking, when we're referring to the installation guidelines, the speed is referring to the speed limit or to the 80th, uh, 85th percentile speed? Um, I'm going to check, check the exact language, but my recollection is uh, it's talking about the speed limit. But if you can hold on one second, we're pulling that up right now. And uh, let's see, 
speed limit. No, it says specifically speed limit. 85th is not uh, mentioned. Okay. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, we have a, a question here when we're talking about uh, roundabouts. Uh, why does the manual include inconsistencies on using yellow line around the center island? Uh, I'm not sure why the questioner is calling it inconsistencies, uh, other than perhaps you may be saying that the yellow line is not shown in all of the figures. Uh, that's because the use of that yellow edge line around the, circuit, the center island is optional. Uh, there is no requirement for that ed yellow edge line. Okay. Okay, I think that helps clarify things. Um, now, uh, I have a question here from David who would like to know, what regulatory colors are not permitted in special pavement areas such as in crosswalks or in bike lanes? Well, uh, anything that, the, uh, that looks like uh, an MUTCD standard color for traffic control devices. Uh, so if you think about that, you've got uh, blue, which is reserved for, cro for uh, handicapped and obviously for motorist services signs. Uh, red would be prohibited because it's associated with, you know, stop or do not enter. Uh, basically, the idea is to, to avoid any potential confusion of drivers that, 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 that might think that that color within the crosswalk is trying to tell them something. Okay? So it's somewhat, sometimes it's an issue of common sense. And what some jurisdictions have done is, again, this should be for aesthetics and nothing more than aesthetics. If you're trying to send a message to the driver, uh, you shouldn't be trying to do it with color inside of a crosswalk. But if you're doing it for aesthetics uh, and bricks, you know, just plain old brick color is not what you want, then select some other color that cannot possibly be confused as a traffic control color. Some, you know, pea green or, you know, I mean, there's, there's lots of different things out there that don't look like a traffic control color. That's the best advice I can give you. Now, one, one item I would add to Scott's answer, though, is that um, we are doing a lot of experimentation right now in addition to the bike boxes with green pavement markings inside of bicycle lanes, either throughout their length or in conflict areas. And even the bike boxes, many of them have a, a green color behind them. Initially, some of the bike experiments from years ago used blue, but we got away from that because of the handicapped conflict, that blue is used for handicapped parking spaces and, and other uses. But um, So the green is probably not the best idea inside the crosswalk either, although right now it doesn't conflict with anything in the manual. It may at some point in the future if we were to decide that the green marking would be appropriate for bicyclists. Of course, if the crosswalk is shared by pedestrian to bicyclists, it may be the best color to put inside because it would convey that message. But that's a future issue. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, our next question comes from Vince, and he would like to know whether drivers can still get a ticket for running the red light of a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, all state state vehicle codes uh, are very clear on what the meaning is of, a, of both a steady red indication or a flashing red indication. They both have defined meanings that are enforceable. And the pedestrian hybrid beacon, uh, the thing that really makes it different is the fact that it's dark in between activations. But once it's called into, into operation, uh, it starts out with flashing yellow to give people the driver's a little bit of a warning that something's going to change, and then it goes to steady yellow, and then it goes to steady red. And if somebody runs that steady red, they definitely can get a ticket. And then, of course, once the walk uh, indication has completed and, and it has changed to flashing don't walk for the pedestrian, this hybrid beacon goes to an alternating wigwag flashing red facing, tra facing vehicular traffic. And, of course, the defined meaning of any flashing red is the same as a stop sign. Stop and remain stopped until it's safe to proceed. 
And that means that each individual vehicle is required by law to come to a full stop before proceeding. They've got to make sure that there are no pedestrians in their way before they proceed one by one. Okay, that sounds good. Um, our next question comes from uh, Stephen. And he would like to know, could you discuss the decision not to require accessible pedestrian signals when countdown signals are provided in light of the ADA requirement to provide equally effective communication to those with visual impairment? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting and a very good question. And um, basically, the US Access Board, uh, which as you know, administers ADA and is working on the uh, public right-of-way accessibility uh, guidelines. But the Access Board and uh, their advisors in the form of uh, mobility uh, experts for blind people, they have recommended against providing audible messages uh, counting down the countdown, for example, 10, 9, 8, 7. And the reason is, that the studies that they have, the information that they have available is that that audible countdown would be, it would be counter to the purposes of, of what the blind people need while they're actually in the crosswalk trying to get across the street. The blind people rely on sound. They're listening for the sound of vehicles that might be trying to cross their path when making turns, uh, vehicles that might be running the red light, uh, and they're also trying to orient themselves to find the far side of the crosswalk. And this all depends on sound. And again, the recommendations that have come to us have been quite clear that don't, it's not a good idea to provide an audible countdown because it interferes with, with the blind pedestrian's ability to safely get across. Okay, um, thank you very much for that explanation. I think that was great. Um, our, uh, our, our next question comes from Fred, and, and he would like to know, can you review the countdown signal buffer time? <laughs> yeah, um, this is a kind of a complicated subject, but the bottom line is up, up until now, and, and this hasn't changed, when the countdown is provided, what's supposed to happen is that the countdown has to end, reach its zero point, no later than the beginning of the yellow. That's what the 2003 edition said. Now, because the minimum time of the yellow is three seconds, what that means is that there always has been a three-second buffer, if you want to think of it that way, between the end of the countdown and the beginning, the, the earliest possible time that a green light could be given to the cross street. So there's always kind of been a requirement for the buffer, but now what's changed is that uh, there's, a real, there's been a realization that some agencies have been extending the flashing orange hand through the yellow interval. Most controllers, most modern controllers are set up so that the flashing orange hand always will end uh, at the beginning of the yellow. But there are some older controllers, pre-timed mechanical controllers and so forth, where the, some cities have just historically run their flashing, don't walk, their flashing orange hand to continue on through the yellow. And then it goes steady uh, hand when the red comes on. And if they were providing countdowns with that kind of an operation, uh, there would be no buffer. And that's not good, because the vast majority of locations uh, do have that buffer built in. Pedestrians are becoming accustomed to it. It's almost like an all red for vehicles, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so uh, hopefully that explains it. Like I say, it's kind of a complicated subject. But if you look at that figure 4E2 uh, in detail, uh, hopefully, it'll be clearer to you. OK. Um, moving on to the next question um, from Larry. He asks whether, um, whether the W54A sign, and that's the sign 
um, that says path narrows, whether that sign could say trail narrows um, rather than path narrows, if appropriate. Um, and it kind of brings up the other question of um, whether or not the MUTCD restricts the use of um, you know, creative signs for situations that may not already be covered in the MUTCD. Yeah, um, we did change the official sign, the W5-4A, to be path narrows, as I showed on a slide earlier. And, uh, but word message signs for warnings and regulations that aren't covered by a particular sign in here uh, adequately can be used. Agencies aren't allowed to develop their own symbols and place symbols on the signs that may not be recognizable to out-of-town or out-of-state motorists. So uh, that's, that's never allowed. If they're going to use a symbol on a sign that's not been used before, they need to get a experimental approval. But um, Chapter 2C on warning signs does mention that word message signs of certain warnings uh, not covered by the manual can be used. Now the question is, is this covered by the manual? And I, I would interpret that liberally to say no. Um, if you think it's more of a trail rather than a path and that, that drivers would recognize it more that way, a trail narrow sign would be fine. <clears throat> The other thing I'd like to add about symbols is, and Bruce is absolutely right in what he said about you can't, can't use unapproved symbols. Uh, and the biggest problem with that is agencies think their symbol is good, but the reality is what symbols need is human factors testing to A, make sure they're understandable, comprehensible by people, and B, is the legibility issue. We see an awful lot of unapproved symbols out on the road that some agency has thought is good, and the symbol is just horribly designed. It's got way too much detail. It can't be, it's not legible from any kind of decent distance. So that's, that's why agencies are not authorized to use their own symbols. Okay, thank you for, for that explanation. Um, now I have a couple of questions um, related to shared bike lane markings or sharrows. Um, the first is, can you use the shared bike lane pavement marker in lieu of edge line bike lane markings? Um, well, that's kind of an interesting question because they, they really cover two different situations. If the lane is wide enough that you could actually place a bicycle lane, a four-foot bicycle lane, and still have enough room for the motor vehicle, then the bike lane would be the appropriate way to mark a bicycle facility on that street. Um, you would not want to use the, the sharrow in that case. The sharrow is intended, or shared lane marking, to be where the lane is so narrow that bicyclists and motor vehicles can't uh, pass each other within that lane. They can't occupy the same lane as, as they overtake each other. Um, so the shared lane marking is used for, for narrow travel lanes, and bike lanes are used where there's a wider bike lane. Now, th there are some places where the lane is wide. It's so wide that, that a shared lane marking isn't the appropriate symbol, but um, they don't want to put a bike lane down. So you can, I've known many jurisdictions that have a 14-foot curb lane just so that bicyclists can be accommodated uh, adequately in that lane without requiring motor vehicle drivers to, to change lanes to pass. And, uh, but they don't necessarily put a stripe down and make it an official bike lane. So you've really got three conditions. You've got wide enough and a bike lane is provided. You've got wide enough and no bike lane is provided. Or you have narrow uh, and, and a shared lane marking is provided. Okay, and these, these shared lane markings, they're not just for streets with parallel parking. Is that correct? No, definitely not. Um, in fact, the, the distances that are discussed in here for how far away they need to be from the curb line uh, talks about at least four feet from the face of the curb or the edge of the pavement where there's no curb, where there is no parking, and at least 11 feet from the face of the curb where there's parallel parking. So. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, they can be used in narrow lanes, whether it's next to parallel parking or it's not. Okay. And uh, one more question about sharrows. Um, does the use of the pavement marking sharrow require the use of a sign with them? No, it does not. You can just okay. use a shared lane marking uh, without a sign, 
You can also, uh, if you want to, you can use that bikes may use full lane sign is the most appropriate sign to put with it. <coughs> um, but you don't have to use both of them in combination. You can use just the marking. You can use just the sign. Okay. Or you can use them both. Sounds good. Um, I now I have a few questions about the pedestrian hybrid beacon or the Hawk. Um, the first one asks, would it be correct to say that a pedestrian hybrid beacon is only for a mid-block crossing based upon your half-signal concerns? Or do you have a suggestion besides a full-blown signal to address the situation in your picture showing the school crossing with the forbidden half-signal? Well, the uh, the pedestrian hybrid beacon is recommended. If you look at the language in the MUTCD, it says it should not be installed at or, or within 100 feet of a, a stop sign controlled side street. So yes, that is based on the concern about half signals. Because uh, in reality, as I said, a, a hawk signal, a hybrid beacon, is it, it, it's very similar to a traffic signal, other than the fact that it goes dark in between actuations. And it, ha it has a lot of the same concerns that a, hawk, a half signal does. And <clears throat> so that's, again, that's a guidance, should not. Uh, so that would say that in most cases, if you're considering a hybrid beacon, you should try to locate it a mid-block or away from the minor intersections. Now, we recognize that there are going to be some situations where the best location and the only feasible location for a hybrid beacon, pedestrian hybrid beacon, is going to be at or very close to an intersection. Now, and because it's guidance, it means that uh, if an engineering study is performed that documents why this is the best location, the only location, then that guidance can be overruled, basically. But it has to be a very good engineering reason. And the thing I would recommend, anytime you consider putting a hybrid beacon at a in minor intersection like that is to look at remedial measures to reduce the conflicts between that side street traffic and the pedestrians who are crossing. Things like making the side street one way away from the intersection, making it right turn only, something like that so that, the, so that they're not turning across the path of the pedestrian crossing. Uh, there are remedial measures that can be considered and that's, that should be part of the engineering study uh, that would lead perhaps to a decision to install one at an intersection. Okay. Um, uh, one questioner, uh, she would like to know what happened to the rapid rectangular flashing beacons? It's still good. It's still, there lots of them are being installed. Uh, they received interim approval back in 2008 after we published the notice of proposed amendments to the MUTCD. So it was basically too late to include them in the 2009 edition. Uh, we, it has to go through rulemaking to put a new device like that into the MUTCD. So basically the interim approval is still in effect. Any jurisdiction that wants to use the rectangular rapid flashing beacon can do so simply by the formality of writing a letter to FHWA and requesting approval to use it under the interim approval procedure. We will send an approval letter out and you're good to go. And a lot of agencies are doing that now. But it will definitely be proposed for inclusion in the next edition of the manual. Okay, um, sounds good. I actually have a couple of questions about the process of the manual itself. Um, I'm going to just read a couple of them. Um, how often is the manual updated? And um, maybe you can talk about um, when people can, uh, when, when they can start using the additions before their state adopts them, or how many states have already adopted the new MUTCD? Well, okay, let me, let me start out, and then uh, I'll let Scott answer how many states have adopted, because he probably has a better idea. No, you don't? Okay. <laughs> We're not sure how many states have adopted it. We know that some do, would say maybe Automatic. five or ten automatically do it, something like that. Yeah. So they've, it's probably been adopted in at least five or ten states by now. 
But they, as I said earlier, they all have until January of, of 2012 to uh, adopt the manual or put their own out or supplements there too. <clears throat> so um, as far as using the devices that are in the federal manual now, uh, before the state adopts that manual, that's up to each state to determine how that's going to be handled. So, uh, yeah, FHWA you know. has basically said it's not our issue. As far as we're concerned, the national manual allows these new devices. It's up to the state to decide how they're going to handle it until they actually adopt the national manual. And, and as far as the uh, aspect of that question relating to the frequency of new manuals coming out, uh, we showed back in 2003 that we could put it out in a three-year interval, that we could do an in, develop an NPA, look at comments, and then develop a final rule and publish a new manual in a three-year period. But after having done so, <clears throat> particularly with the two-year adoption cycle, uh, we were having a lot of, of users, readers of the manual, who were saying three years is too sudden, that, that's too quick, we don't want a new manual every three years. After some meetings with uh, some of the some of the stakeholder uh, groups, including the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, uh, it was determined that our, our best policy would be to try to go on about a five-year cycle, approximately a five-year cycle. So you can expect that the next MUTCD edition would probably be a 2014 or possibly a 2015 edition. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that information. Um, now I've gotten a, uh, quite a few questions on calculating walking speeds, and so I'm just going to um, give you this one. Please explain the distinction between the three and a half feet per second versus the three feet per second in walking speeds, um, as this will have some impacts on the need for median refuges on some projects. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so let me give you an example. Let's say that a street is uh, 120 feet wide at the crosswalk. The length of the crosswalk is 120 feet. Uh, you would first calculate the duration of the pedestrian clearance interval, which is normally the flashing orange hand interval, uh, at 3.5 feet per second. You would divide 120 feet by 3.5, and I don't have my calculator <laughs> handy, but... I thought you were going to use a number. Uh, <laughs> no, I, did, I couldn't think of a number that would <laughs> automatically uh, come out, but uh, let's just say the street is, is so wide that... Uh, well, Bruce, you you calculating it right now? I will. Go ahead and keep All going. All right, okay. but you, ca you calculate that number of seconds based on 3.5 feet per second, and... Uh, then what you do is you do this cross check, and instead of using the 120-foot crosswalk length, you use a longer distance. You go up to the top of the curb ramp or to where the pedestrian push button is located. For example, where a wheelchair user might be positioned at the point when the walk signal comes on. That's the idea here is to check for a slower walking pedestrian. You have a 35-second. Okay, thanks, Bruce. So 35 seconds is what you need based on 3.5 feet per second, or 120 feet. Now you add, let's just say, 6 feet to that 120-foot uh, crosswalk length because you're going to go up to the top of the curb ramp. So you take 126 feet and you divide it by 3.0 feet per second. You're going to come out with, in this case, uh, a, long, a longer number, right? right? 35, let's see, it's probably going to be about uh, 37 seconds, all right? So the, an the answer you would get is 37. Now, what you're going to compare that 37 to is not the 35 you calculated in the first step. You're going to compare it to the sum of the walk interval time plus the flashing orange hand time. So if your walk interval is set at 7 seconds, for example, 7 plus 35 is 42. 37 seconds is less, oh, I'm sorry, 37 is not the right answer because it's at 3 feet per second. Mm -hmm. It's going to come out something more than that, right? 40-something, 40, 40 probably 42. Well, let, let's just say 44. For the purposes of an example, right. let's say it comes out to 44. 44 is greater than 
7 plus 35. It's two seconds greater than, than what you originally have for walk plus flashing don't walk. What that cross-check tells you is you should add two seconds to the walk interval, not to the flashing don't walk. You should bump your walk interval up from seven seconds to nine to account for that slower walking pedestrian, but you're assuming that that pedestrian is starting right at the beginning of the walk rather than leaving the curb at the end of the walk. It's a compromise. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a way that's been determined to try to provide a little bit more time for the slower walking pedestrians on wide streets. If you perform this kind of calculation on a narrower street, anything less than 90 feet, 95 feet or so, you're going to find that in most cases it's not going to result in you needing to add any time. Hopefully that made it clear. Okay. Um, I, hope people have their, <laughs> Sorry, I, hope, I hope people have their pencils and papers out <laughs> and we're following yeah. along. Um, but uh, yeah, that's great. I, I, we definitely saw a number of questions about um, making those calculations. So. Um, we'll remember to bring a calculator next time we do. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, now, I've had a, a couple of questions about the, um, the R1015 sign, um, and maybe you can just um, describe that sign um, when you're answering this question. Uh, the questions specifically are, um, can the arrow in the new R1015 sign be flipped so that it applies to left-turning traffic? Um, and... Um, in states where turning motors are required to stop for pedestrians and crosswalks, can the yield symbol in the R1015 sign be replaced with a stop sign? Okay, well, the answer to the first question is, is an easy one. Yes, there can be a left-pointing arrow rather than a right-pointing arrow. And, in fact, the standard highway signs and markings book that's under development right now uh, we'll have both versions of that sign, the R1015R, which is pictured in the manual, and the R10-15L, which is the reverse or the, or the uh, left turn arrow <coughs> sign. Um, so that one's the easy question. The question, can you replace the yield with a stop sign? Um, it sounds like a similar thing that's been done with the yield here to pedestrians, but instead of yield to, it says stop four. So I would think if somebody modified this sign and put stop for pedestrians, they would also want to put four rather than two, not numbers, F-O-R and T-O, uh, on that sign as well. <clears throat> I've also had the question asked, um, can the pedestrian symbol be replaced with a bicycle symbol to say that um, the yield to or stop for bicyclists? And uh, normally... Um, you know, the bicycle symbol is well recognized, but it doesn't fit well on this particular sign because the pedestrian has a vertical aspect to its symbol and the bicycle has a horizontal aspect. So that would be quite a, an alteration of the sign. But um, I would say the stop for pedestrian would, would probably be okay because we've also used it on the other types of signs if that happens to be the law that people have to... Although, you know, this is actually used at traffic signals. So um, it's kind of a conflicting message. you got a green for go and then a stop law that says you have to stop for pedestrians in the crosswalk. Most signals, you don't have to stop. You just have to yield. But anyway, I'm rambling, but the point is I think you could modify it if you felt that was a better message and better conform to your state law to say stop for pedestrians. Okay. Okay, um, we are um, coming close to our time here, but um, I've got quite a few questions left. Maybe we'll take a couple more, if that sounds okay. Um, one question I have, uh, going back to roundabouts, is um, do you have any specific signage or recommendations for cycling within a roundabout? Well, <clears throat> the, the MUTCD in, in Part 3 regarding markings is very specific in saying that bike lanes shall not uh, be provided within the circulatory roadway of a roundabout. If, they, if you've got a bike lane on one of the legs approaching a roundabout, you need to discontinue that bike lane and get bikes. Uh, what, what many jurisdictions have done is provided kind of like a little uh, ramp, a little slip ramp to uh, bring bikes up onto the sidewalk before they get to the, uh, to the roundabout. But we recognize that there are uh, lots of different 
shapes and sizes of roundabouts and volumes as well. And uh, there, there are probably some low volume roundabouts where it might be okay for a bicyclist to go into the circular roadway as a bicyclist rather than as a pedestrian. But there would be no special markings or signs for that. Right, and, and there's no question that the bicycle lane needs to be discontinued through the roundabout. Uh, that's clearly spelled out in the manual as a requirement. Uh, the one thing that comes to my mind that might be appropriate in, in the circulatory roadway would be a shared lane marking. Um, that, that would be an acceptable symbol to put into the uh, roundabout, but I would caution people in terms of whether they want to use that or not to really think about it because I think at the moment, uh, motorists are becoming more and more accustomed to how to operate in, in roundabouts, but we already have solid lane lines and we have dashed, uh, broken lane lines, dotted lane lines. We've got lane use arrows. We've got a lot of things going on in a roundabout when you look at these figures in uh, Chapter 3C that adding a shared lane marking to might just be overload, um, even though it may alert drivers that bicyclists are using the roundabout. So it is allowed, um, whether it's a good idea or not, a good engineering practice uh, would be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. That's a good point. Um, uh, one more question about the sharrows here. Are there guidelines for appropriate maximum vehicle speed limits on streets with sharrows? Yes, I, I think it's 35 miles per hour. Let me make sure I'm correct in that. Okay. That's back in Section 9C.07. Uh, you know what, I don't see it there, so it may be that I'm thinking the bikes may use full lane sign, having that maximum. So I know we put it in one place or the other. Oh, I don't see it there either. Let me go back to 9C07 quickly and see if it's in there. If it's not in either place, then I know what happened. It was in the notice proposed amendments, and we elected not to use it. 35. Oh, yeah, here it is. I'm sorry, I, did, I overlooked it the first time. Paragraph 2 in Section 9C.07 on shared lane markings is a guidance statement that says the shared lane marking should not be placed on roadways that have a speed limit above 35 miles per hour. So yes, it did get in there as guidance not to use them on, on high-speed roadways higher than 35 miles per hour. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, another, we seem to be getting a lot of questions about the shares. We're also getting a lot of questions about the, the hybrid beacons, and I'll just ask one more of those. Um, are there warrants of minimum volumes of cars and pedestrians for um, pedestrian hybrid beacon like there are for pedestrian signals? Yes, they are. Uh, they're not presented so much in the form of warrants, uh, but there is a guidance uh, statement in there in Section uh, 4F01 about pedestrian hybrid beacons uh, that, that basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you should probably just read it for yourself. There's several different paragraphs here that discuss just exactly what you're talking about. And there are figures. There's figure 4F1 and 4F2 that are graphic. It's the same kind of graphical approach that uh, you're plotting points of major street volume and pedestrian crossing volume uh, based on also length of the crosswalk. So it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. But they're guidelines. OK. I think I'm going to uh, close up with this one last question here. Um, related to the adoption of the METCD. Do you have a recommendation related um, to the timeline for a state agency that may not make the two-year time frame for the 2009 adoption? If they don't make the two-year timeline, they're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, seriously. Two, two years, uh, it, it's in the law. Uh, it, it's federal law that they have to do it in, within two years. And Basically, it's their responsibility to plan out their process. We realize that some of them, some states have to uh, get an act of the legislature. Some states have to go through their own rulemaking process to adopt 
uh, a manual. But this is nothing new. This, is, this has been going on for quite a while now, every time a new edition of the manual comes out. And states by now should have their process in place to, so that they can manage it uh, and get it done within two years. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and I, I guess with that, I'm going to end it. Um, sorry that's all the time we have for discussion. And there was um, lots of great uh, questions left unanswered. Um, but I want to thank our speakers, uh, Bruce Friedman and Scott Wainwright of the MUTCD, uh, MUTCD team at FHWA. Um, thank you so much for handling all those questions. And um, if we didn't get to your question today, I'm going to go through all the, all the questions that, that we didn't answer, and, and um, I might try to get back in touch with you. And um, if you have anything specific, don't hesitate to contact me at um, webinars at hsrc.unc.edu, or you can call me at 919-843-4859, and we'll try to put you in touch with the right resources. Um, and I just want to uh, point you to some related resources that we'll um, link to on the archives page of today's webinar. And um, if you haven't had a chance to see the new MUTCD, you can find it at mutcd.fhwa.dot.gov. And I uh, also want to let you know that the PBC has compiled many engineering solutions at walkinginfo.org/engineering. And um, and also, um, it might be helpful for you to um, check out the PBIC image library, um, where you can view, use, and post images related to biking and walking. And this is, uh, includes lots of images of signals, signs, and other traffic control devices. So you can find the PBIC image library at www.pedbikeimages.org. And I want to remind you that you will be able to access a recording and transcript of today's program, as well as view a PDF copy of the slide presentation at www.walkinginfo.org slash webinars. And at this page, you will be able to register for the next Livable Communities webinar, scheduled for Thursday, May 13th, from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m., with PBIC program specialist Carl Sundstrom, who will be introducing the new Walk Friendly Communities program. Walk Friendly Communities has been developed by the PBIC and a team of national partners, and its purpose is to recognize existing walkable communities and to provide a framework for communities seeking to improve their walkability, and uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for that presentation. I also want to remind you that a very brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. Again, we very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Uh, thanks again to our speakers, Bruce and Scott. They were wonderful. Um, and thanks also to today's co-sponsors, APBP. And thanks to all of you for attending the PBIC Livable Communities webinar. Um, have a great um, rest of your day. Thank you very much.